Good morning. Welcome to the fourth of our seminars on running the final lap with Professor John Wyatt, who's Emeritus Professor of uh, Neonatal Medicine at University College London. Uh, a, a great friend of Keswick Convention, I should say, He's spoken on many occasions, and many of us have found his books uh, a tremendous help. As we come to uh, our session this morning, the subject is approaching the finishing line, dying well, which sounds like a grim subject, but actually it's such an important thing for us all to think about. Let me, uh, as I welcome you, open us in prayer. Our Father God, we thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to hear from your servant this morning about this, uh, such an important subject. And we pray that you give to him his customary clarity and help each one of us as a result of what we hear this morning, when it is our turn uh, to die, uh, to die well. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So as I welcome John up to the front, I just want to say that afterwards our prayer team will be willing to, we'd love to speak to any of you if this raises issues for you. And before, uh, between the end of John's talk and before that, uh, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. John. Thanks very much indeed, Alistair. And thank you again for uh, this, your journey going on the final lap with me over you, those of you who've been with us over the four sessions. Well done for making it towards the finishing line, at least metaphorically, if not in reality. And um, I understand that this topic uh, is, is one that raises questions, anxieties, fears, uh, because we can't help thinking about our own mortality. We know that unless the Lord comes, uh, we are going to have our own finishing line, and we don't know when that could be. We don't know exactly where we are on the race. And I know that coming to a session like this may be raising fears. I spoke to a, a lady some, uh, early, earlier on in the, in the convention, and she said, for personal reasons, well, I really ought to be coming to that session, but I'm, I'm just not sure I can face it. So I, I understand that, but I hope together, we, as, we, as we look at these things, you know, one thing I've learned over the years is it's so much better to, to look at these things face to face, at the difficult things of life, rather than try and pretend they don't exist. The greatest fear is the fear of the unknown. And actually, God, as we will see, God wonderfully allows us to practice what it means to die well. But that's, that's a bit later on. Uh, and just again to remind you that handouts are available for all four sessions on the website, and they're fairly full handouts. Most of the text of the PowerPoint are there on handouts. Please feel free to use them and copy them as you, as you wish. So my text for this morning is taken from Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And we'll come back to that text a bit later on. So we're thinking about the finishing line. Each of us is on, a, on an endurance race, and uh, of course we know these kind of images of... Um, of the runners after 26 long miles, hours of effort, and at last there's that final glorious moment. And it's just interesting, you know, some are finishing with enormous energy, hands in the air, others are just staggering through. And uh, it's well known, apparently, I'm not a marathon runner, but I, I talk to people who are marathon runners, that actually the final phase of a long run can be the most tricky. Uh, and, you know, you could have been uh, doing really well for most of those miles, and it can all go horribly wrong just in those last few uh, yards or in that final lap. And there are dramatic images you can find on the internet of, of, of people collapsing just within uh, a few yards of the, of the finishing line. Or I, I found this one of a, somebody collapsing and being supported uh, across the finishing line, just literally... Uh, along. So, so sometimes we need support as we, as we come to the, as the finishing line. But I, I, I'm reminded of those, uh, of these words from John Dunlop, John Dunlop, a Christian physician. One thing I have learned 
is that dying well is rarely a coincidence. Rather, it results from choices made throughout life. After all, dying well is nothing more than living well right up to the end. Dying well is nothing more than living well right up to the end. So, that, so the first basic lesson is the more we can learn to live well as Christian believers, the, more, the better, the easier it will be to die well. Um, and so there's a very interesting kind of ambiguity, ambivalence about the way that the Christian faith teaches us about death. From a Christian perspective, death is always an enemy. The death of human beings is not something to be welcomed and hastened. Death is an enemy which we can, must fight against. And as a, as a doctor and a health professional, I've spent many years fighting against death in my patients, uh, working as a pediatrician and neonatologist in a, a baby unit, for an intensive care unit for babies, I can remember sleepless nights, battling, fighting, trying to hold death away from this tiny little form in an incubator, using all my skill, all my resources, every, everything that modern medicine had to offer, just to try and hold and keep death away. Why? Because death is an enemy, and, and life is good. As, as Celia, my wife, quoted that text, uh, I have set before you life and death, therefore choose life. So, so death in, in, in Christian thinking is always an enemy. And yet, by God's grace, <clears throat> death can change from being something that we fight against to something that we accept as a severe mercy, a strange kind of healing, even in an adventure and a gateway into a new world, into the new heaven and the new earth. And so the whole art of approaching the end of the life is, is, is working out when am I called to fight against death and say, no, I, uh, it's important for me to stay here as long as possible. And when is the time to say enough is enough and death turns into this severe mercy and turns into a gateway. And one of the things that I've seen over the years and I really want to pass on is that death, dying well, can bring amazing opportunities. It genuinely does. This is not just sort of saying nice things. I've seen time and time again how the process of dying can become, by God's grace, something very significant, uh, uh, something that um, the Spirit uses. And I'm just very rapidly going to go through some of the ways in which that can happen. I've seen time and time again how dying can be an opportunity for spiritual growth, so that although the body itself is decaying and whatever the the pathological processes are going on and the body's getting weaker. Internally, the person is growing. The person is, is, is changing. And, and that verse in 2 Corinthians, so focusing on the inner, inner thing, the inner beauty. And, and so it's a paradox, isn't it, that it's well known that often in our lives when things are going well, when everything seems fine, actually, often we don't really grow as people. We don't really grow spiritually. But it's in the challenge. It's in the difficulty. It's in, the, in, in the, where we need perseverance, where we need courage, where we need faith. Actually, that's when the way that the Spirit uses to bring out the pure gold. Again, this uh, relationship between suffering and glory and yes, there may be suffering towards the end of life, but by God's grace, that can bring a new kind of glory. And then, dying well is an opportunity for healing broken relationships, for building relationships which are weak, 
for celebrating relationships which are strong and healthy and lovely and for completing relationships. Now that may sound like a rather strange word. Is there a sense in which our relationships are ever completed? And I think that in one sense, our relationships by God's grace are gonna go on into the new heaven and the new earth. I think personally, although this is speculation, that our friendships uh, with other believers is something that will be preserved and it's something we will renew our friendships and acquaintances in the new heaven and the new earth in, by God's grace. So there's a sense in which our relationships will go on and on into eternity. But there's also a sense in which it's not good to die in a relationship where there is unfinished business. If there are things which need to be said, if there is uh, brokenness, if there, are, if there is difficulty, then actually dying well is an opportunity for us to set things right. And one of the curious and wonderful things is that a person who is dying has a kind of relational authority which you don't have in the rest of your life. So it's possible for somebody who's dying to say, I really think we ought to talk about this. Or I haven't spoken to my son for 30 years and the last time we spoke we had this terrible argument, but would it be possible for someone to find my son and for us to have this final conversation? And because the person is dying time and time again, they're allowed to get away with things like that, which otherwise in the rest of life you wouldn't do. So, so dying well is an opportunity for healing broken relationships and also for celebrating uh, and, and, and passing on uh, good relationships. It's an opportunity for finding forgiveness. Uh, again, this is something that I've seen uh, on, on several occasions, how some deep brokenness inside, which has been there for years, sometimes for decades, and which has never been resolved. Uh, I tell the story in, um, in my book, Dying Well, but just very briefly, this is a, a, a true story which a friend of mine told me. She said her mother had always been this very difficult um, lady. She had uh, a, a sharp tongue. She was, she was well known to be just very difficult uh, and, and high maintenance person to, to know. And her daughter had found faith as a student and had uh, received Christ, but her mother had always been resistant. She didn't want to hear anything about the gospel, and she carried on being a very difficult lady. And then she was diagnosed with cancer, and it was obviously at a very advanced stage, and the mother was sitting with the daughter in the hospital, in the waiting area, in the oncology department. And you can imagine what it's like in a hospital waiting area and people are going by and bleeps are going off and telephones and busyness. And the mother turns to the daughter and says, I've just got three questions. One, how can I forgive? Two, how can I be forgiven? And three, what happens when I die? And it all poured out in the outpatient department, and it turned out that her mother had been abused as a child. And actually, this anger and this bitterness all stemmed back to this childhood episode, and that's why her first question was, how can I forgive? Uh, and so her daughter shares with her about the gospel there in the outpatient department and, um, and about how dying in Christ can be something, uh, that a gateway into the new heaven and the new earth. And the daughter said, my mother was remade in the last three weeks, weeks of her life. She only lived for three weeks after that conversation. She was admitted into a hospice and the nurses said, oh, we just so loved looking after this woman. She's so kind. She's so gentle, she's so thankful, and, uh, and the daughter said, that's not my mother. And uh, she died peacefully in the hospice with her daughter singing sing psalms and hymns to her 
and reading from the Bible. And there with, um, she just passed peacefully away. And with her daughter holding her hand, the nurses came into this room. Um, and with the body of her mother there, the nurses said, oh, this is, we've never seen anyone die like this. This is just so wonderful. And so the daughter was able to share the gospel with these nurses. Uh, and she said, I just couldn't believe that that could happen. Now, of course, that's a pretty spectacular example, but it shows you that finding forgiveness, that dying well is an opportunity. Reordering priorities, finding what's really important for you, what really matters, fulfilling dreams. Again, when you're dying, it's remarkable what you can say. You know, you can say, you know what? I've always wanted to go to Disneyland. Now's the opportunity. Uh, and you can get away with it. Whatever it is, whatever that dream is, um, dying well is an opportunity to say, you know what, other things don't matter. This is, this is what I'd love to do. Letting go, recognizing there are things I'm going in my life that I'm never going to do. I'm never going to be able to sort out my bookshelves, tidy my office. <laughs> but I'm going to let go. I'm never going to finish that project. I'm going to hand it over. Being thankful. We've talked again about gratitude. And one of the things I've noticed time and time again is that sometimes with people who are dying, it's the preciousness, you know, the preciousness of a person's smile, of that baby who comes to visit, of watching a bird flying and building a nest, of seeing the seasons through the window. Sometimes it's these little things which become incredibly important. Leaving a legacy for the next generation. One of the wonderful things you can do is either write a letter or just record on a phone a simple message, a video, a something, an audio text message, and just leave it for people who matter to you. Um, sometimes people do this for their children, for their grandchildren, for their spiritual children, for the people who matter to you. Uh, sometimes for grandchildren, I'm going to write you a letter and I want you to open it when you're 21 or when you leave home or when you're getting married or not, as the case may be. So there, how, what can I do to pass on a legacy for the next generation? Something, just a testimony to God's faithfulness to me, the things I've learned, the things that matter, the things that have sustained me. What, what would you, because this is where the, this, the idea of the final words, you know, what, what, what was someone's final words when they died? That used to be a, a tradition, but it was the same idea of passing on something for the next generation. My father died very, very suddenly with no warning at all. I just got the message. He'd, he'd collapsed and was dead, and it was a terrible shock. And I always regret the fact that we never had that last conversation, that I wasn't able just to hold him in my arms and say how much I loved him. And he wasn't able to say something to me. You know, John, I want you always to remember this. Because, you know, if my father had said that to me before he died, I would never have forgot it. There's the relational authority that you have when you're dying. So what would you like to pass on? What would you like to say? to the next generation, to your loved ones, to your spiritual children. And then focusing on the finishing line as knowing that we're, we're dying well, knowing, looking towards uh, that last moment and, and, and praying that God would be there with us. And who do I want to share this experience with me as I go over the finishing line? You know, it's interesting. If you ask people how they would want to die, I think you can guess what the commonest answer you will get in our society. And that is, I want to die in my bed at night. I want to have no warning. I want to have no premonition. I just want to go to bed one night and whew, there it is, sudden glory. What a wonderful way to die. You know, it's interesting, if you were to go back three or 400 years you would find that sudden death like that, sudden unexpected death, 
was regarded as the worst possible way to die. To be catapulted into eternity with no possibility of preparing yourself to meet your maker. No possibility of saying goodbye. No possibility of passing on something. No possibility of making provision. Just to go, uh, just to go out like a light. What a terrible way to die. And in fact, there's a, a prayer, an ancient prayer in the Church of England in the prayer book, God save us from unexpected death. Um, so isn't it interesting that for modern people, just going out like a light is now seen as the best way. Why is that? Well, I'm afraid what it reflects to me is the narcissism and the self-centeredness of so much of modern culture. All we're thinking about is our precious little selves and the fact that something unpleasant might happen to us, and we don't care at all about the implications for other people. And I hope by telling you about the opportunities and reminding you of the opportunities that you can see why actually I don't want to die like that. I want myself, I do genuinely want to experience some of the things I've just been talking about. I've given talks about dying well. I'd love to experience it myself and, and experience some of those things. Um, I don't want to just go out like a light. Of course, we don't know what God has in store for us, but those are the opportunities that dying can bring. But of course, there are also temptations and challenges, and I haven't time to go into great detail in this. Again, there's more in my book, Dying Well, if you're interested. But I'm fascinated by a, group, a whole series of literature that was circulating around in the Middle Ages in Europe, including here in England, and they were called the Ars Moriendi, uh, or the Art of Dying. And the interesting thing about these documents is that they were, it was a kind of self-help manual for lay people, for the ordinary people. It wasn't intended for priests or clergy or religious people. It was intended for ordinary people helping them to die well. And um, in, in this medieval pre-Reformation Europe, the greatest fear of death is that you would die without a priest being present who would be able to pray those final prayers and usher you in to the next, uh, the next world. And therefore, the, these self-help documents, because of plague and war and, and life was very, very precarious and it was possible that you would face death very rapidly, these self-help documents were, were, were circulating. And uh, I've often thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to try to... Um, have a modern-day equivalent of an Ars Moriendi, and that's really what my book, Dying Well, is a kind of an attempt to have a, a modern-day version of, of these ancient documents. But they talked about uh, five temptations um, for dying people. There was the temptation of doubt, so, and for each temptation, there's a virtue that you need to develop. There's a temptation of doubt that some people, as they approach the end, uh, are maybe attacked by, by fears and doubt and questions about whether, they, whether God exists and whether it's true that my sins have been forgiven and so on. There's a temptation of despair and the virtue of hope. There's a temptation of impatience. That sounds slightly strange. I think a better translation would be petulance. Sometimes you find that as people are approaching the end, there's a kind of childish petulance uh, that, that comes out. Um, and, 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 as, and that's one of those temptations. There's the temptation of pride. Again, that, this sounds rather weird. But interestingly, what the ancients were worried about was spiritual pride. They said spiritual pride is the greatest of all evils, and therefore some people, you know, as they're approaching death, are filled with knowledge of their own holiness and, um, and, and sanctity and, and so on. And so there's the temptation of pride and the virtue of humility. And then they also finally talked about the temptation of greed and the virtue of letting go. Um, 
So I think all of those five temptations are still very real temptations for modern people as they approach uh, the end. But I want to add two modern temptations, and they are the temptation of the denial of death. So some people, including some Christians, actually practice as though death wasn't going to happen. I don't want to think about it. I'm just going to carry on living my life. And uh, I just don't want to make any preparation. I'm just going to carry on focusing on the positive and so on. That's, a kind of, that's denial of death, and it's not healthy. And finally, the temptation of self-reliance and the virtue of dependence. And we talked about dependence in the second uh, session. So one of the things that we have to learn as we approach the finishing line is that dependence is not an evil, negative thing. Just briefly to talk about some practical questions, I think that there are always issues to think about um, as, as we are with medical and nursing pro professionals. And again, I think it's often better to raise these questions uh, in advance. So the sort of questions that it's good to, for somebody who's with a terminal illness to discuss with health professionals is what symptoms am I likely to suffer and what kind of treatment is available for me and what kind of um, treatments would I like to receive and, and should I carry on receiving medical treatment for my condition in the hope that it might prolong my life or would it better, be better to stop all active medical treatments. Um, and this is a, a diagram I've often used when teaching medical students and, and junior doctors, but it's just helpful to understand the basic principles. All medical treatments have potential benefits. They can bring good things, but they also carry burdens and risks they, ha they, they cause problems, they cause difficulties, they, they can do terrible harm. And so the whole art of good ethical medicine is making sure that the benefits of any treatment that you're giving are greater than the burdens and risks. And unfortunately, quite often at the end of life, what happens is that medical treatment is being given, which frankly is doing a lot of harm and making things worse, and causing all kinds of complications, and is, and is frankly doing virtually nothing in terms of benefits. And unfortunately, this kind of over-treatment, over-medicalization is very common at the end of life. And one of the paradoxes about being a doctor is that it's much easier to prescribe a new treatment or to carry on giving a treatment than it is to say, you know what, we need to stop this. This is doing no good at all. It's actually much harder as a doctor to stop treatment than it is to carry it on. And therefore, for various reasons, many, many people come to the end of their life receiving a whole lot of unnecessary and burdensome treatment. And so, these are questions to, to think about and discuss with the health professionals. What is the value of these different treatments I'm receiving? Is it genuinely doing more good than harm? And sometimes it's very difficult. I mean, suppose here's someone and they've got uh, advanced terminal cancer and, um, they, and, and then, the question, then they develop pneumonia. They develop an infection of the lungs, a severe infection of the lungs. And the question is, should we treat this infection? Should we give, well, what... what What's the burdens of the treatment? Well, it's going to need intravenous antibiotics. That means you're going to need to be admitted to hospital. You're going to need to have intravenous cannula. You're going to have to have repeated injections of, uh, of the antibiotics. There's a risk that might cause uh, allergic reaction or some other complications. And what's the benefit? Well, the truth is you're, because the cancer is so advanced, it, the antibiotics are not going to make any difference to the cancer but they might be able to extend your life maybe by a week or two. Now, is that worth doing or not? Well, and the answer is a lot of the times, no, it isn't. And frankly, uh, dying from pneumonia is not unpleasant or difficult and, and, and might be a better way to go. On the other hand, if my daughter is getting married in a week's time or there's some reason why I desperately want to 
want to, to stay alive or something I need to see, then yes, it might be that the benefits of the treatment outweigh the burden. So that's why this kind of balancing process, working out whether treatments um, are appropriate or not, uh, is important. But it's definitely a Christian and an ethical option to say, you know what, I think this treatment is doing no good and therefore I want to stop. Uh, that's not committing suicide, that's not euthanasia, that's good medical care, saying enough is enough. Other questions to ask, where would I like to die? Uh, the truth is most people die in the UK in an NHS hospital. And frankly, an NHS hospital is not a good place to die most of the time. It's much better to die either in a specialist place like a hospice or a home where you're receiving proper support or to, live it, or to die in your own home with appropriate support. But that doesn't happen without advanced planning, without looking ahead and, and making your uh, thoughts known to your relatives, to your loved ones, and to your, um, and to your medical team. Should there be a, a do not attempt resuscitation order? Complex, difficult question. I, I address that in the, in, my, in the book and I haven't got time it, it, now to talk about it. Happy to do it if, if someone would like to discuss that. Very important question. Who's going to support me physically, psychologically, and spiritually at the end? So the interesting thing <clears throat> is that the NHS here in the UK and uh, charities have all agreed that what is now called advanced care planning is what we all should be doing. All of us should be planning ahead, uh, particularly if we have a terminal illness or we're coming to the end of our lives, and in planning ahead in how we would like to die. What, is, what, is the, is what kind of, of, of care would be appropriate? And there are a number of practical things that we can do, and in particular, what I recommend, uh, if it's you or your loved one, is that you think about preparing an ad what is called an advanced statement of preferences. Uh, this is where you write down in detail how, what you would like to happen as you're approaching the end. What kind of treatment you would like to receive, who you would want to be there, where would you wish to be, what would be most important to me. Now, these documents are not legally binding, but they are nonetheless extremely useful and helpful for the health professionals. And it means that even if you've lost the ability to communicate, uh, you are, this document will help the health professionals to know how you want to be treated, what's important for you, who you want to be there. Uh, and again, I've got an example of one, in fact, that John Stott wrote um, I helped him write one of these uh, before he died. And um, so there's an example in my book, Dying Well, on that. But another and very useful uh, thing is to, is to take out a lasting power of attorney. Where a, this is a legally binding document where you donate to somebody else, uh, and it could be a spouse, it could be children, it could be a close friend, someone you trust. You have to have a high level of trust because you're giving this person a huge amount of legal authority over your affairs. Um, Celia and I have taken out lasting power of attorney for our three boys, for both of us. Um, we, and, and therefore, um, it means that if something was to happen to us, our three boys working together have uh, authority to take decisions uh, in our stead. And uh, you can do this without using a lawyer. You can just do this on, a, on the government website, um, and, um, and you just, it's, it's actually a very straightforward process. It's, it's quite bureaucratic. There's lots of pieces of paper and signatures and witnesses to be obtained. But I strongly recommend this because what it means is that whatever happens, there is somebody else who you know and trust who will be there to discuss with the professionals. And the professionals are legally bound to follow what the attorney tells them. So, you, so you're taking on, as an attorney, you're taking on a considerable responsibility. Um, there are two kinds. One is to do with health and welfare, 
and the other kind is to do with financial affairs. And we've taken out both kind of attorneys for our boys, so they're both in charge of the money and they're in charge of life and death. So it's a big, it's a big thing to do, but nonetheless, I strongly recommend it as, as a way forward. And then finally, it is possible to write a document where you say, I don't want to have a particular kind of treatment. If my heart stops, I don't want to be resuscitated or whatever. I personally think this is much less useful, uh, and that is because it's so hard to predict what might happen, and therefore writing out specifically instructions for every possible possibility is almost uh, hopeless and pointless. That's why the power of attorney, where you're giving a person uh, responsibility, uh, seems to work much better. Again, just to say that this book, Dying Well, has got quite a lot of information about and, and can, can take you to further resources about that. What about if you are caring for somebody who's coming to the end of their life? How can I help somebody who's dying? Uh, how can I help them to come to terms with what's happening? And of course, this is very challenging and, and not easy, but again, I just want to suggest some questions that you could ask of, of, of your loved one or of the person you're caring for. And the first question is just to say, well, what's your understanding of what's happening to you? What's your understanding about your medical condition? What have the doctors told you? It's a good way in, rather than sort of starting it with, I want to tell you this, this, and this. It's much better to get the person themselves to share what they understand it. And sometimes, you know, it becomes apparent that the person's understanding themselves is completely unrealistic. It may be that they're not really come to terms at all with the reality of what's going on, and therefore just understanding and, and helping them to, to understand uh, the future is really important. But then there are, there are two uh, groups of questions. And the first is to say, what are you most frightened about? What are you most worried about? And it's interesting that different people have different worries. Some people are worried about excruciating pain. Uh, and actually, we can tell people that with proper expert medical care, you don't need to suffer excruciating pain at all. Um, some people are worried about uh, over-treatment, that doctors are going to insist that they're going to be admitted to hospital, they're going to be have tubes coming out of every orifice, they're going to be uh, dragged into the intensive care unit and kept alive against their will. Um, for other people, it's exactly the opposite. Their greatest fear is that they're just going to be abandoned, they're going to be allowed to die from dehydration and starvation, nobody's going to be to care for them. And so just helping people to, un what, are the, what are you most worried about? Because the more we look at these worries realistically and say, well, what can we do in advance about these worries, I think is really helpful. Uh, and one of the great insights that came from the palliative care movement, and that was led by uh, Dr. Cicely Saunders, a wonderful Christian lady who, who was called by God, uh, to uh, develop this new uh, movement, a way of caring for people at the end of life. And what she realized was that pain at the end of life is much more than just physical pain. In fact, what all doctors know is that of all types of pain, the physical pain is the easy stuff. Actually, dealing with physical pain, with modern medicine, uh, um, medical techniques, it is really pretty easy. The difficult kinds of pain are the other kinds of pain. So the person who is, let's take someone, imagine them dying of cancer. Yes, there's physical pain because the cancer is pressing on nerves and, and causing uh, stimulation of pain fibers and so on, and they've got this constant gnawing ache uh, wherever it is. But then there is psychological pain, which is distress and anxiety. Uh, or depression, things going on in their head, worries, um, negative feelings, and so on. And then there is relational pain. 
these broken relationships with my son that I haven't spoken for for 25 years, or this very difficult uh, relationship with my other half, or with children, or with friends, or, or maybe uh, it, it's just a sense of abandonment and loneliness. I have relational pain. And then there is spiritual or existential pain, maybe feelings of guilt, feelings of fear of meeting my maker, uh, guilt about past events, or maybe just a sense of meaninglessness. And what uh, palliative care specialists have realized is that when people are in agony at, towards the end of life, in quotes, and when however much you give strong painkillers or other things, they, and we often hear these tragic stories of people crying out in pain. This is one of the reasons why people say, well, we've got to have euthanasia because of people who are in pain at the end of life. But the truth is, if you hear a story of somebody who is crying out in pain at the end of life, what that tells you is that it was one of those other pains. Because it turns out that physical painkillers are not so good at dealing with relational pain, spiritual pain. So how do you deal with them? Well, it's pretty obvious. With psychological pain, it's about friendship, it's about encouragement, it's about support. Sometimes it's about professional psychiatric care, about talking therapies, whatever specialist care might be needed. For relational pain, it's about getting the family there, it's about contacting that son asking them to come, it's, it's finding a way of getting uh, resolution and reconciliation, if at all possible. And for spiritual pain, it's putting the care of the dying in a spiritual context. So Cicely Saunders designed her hospice with the chapel in the center of the building, and however sick the people were, they could be pushed in their beds with all the drips and whatever they were having, um, so that they could take part in this daily cycle of worship and the Holy Communion which was taking place. So spiritual care was at the heart of caring for dying people. And in the quote that we said before, suffering is not a question which demands an answer. It's not a problem which demands a solution. It's a mystery which demands presence. And the third group of questions, as you look to the future, what are your goals for this stage? What are the trade-offs you're willing to make? What would you long to happen before you die? And how can we help you achieve that? And so, as we think about this, this age, you know, God's plan for this age is not to abolish suffering. One day, hallelujah, he is going to abolish suffering, but not for this age. But his plan is to redeem suffering, to bring blessing and healing out of the pain, out of the suffering, out of the loss, out of the bereavement. That's what God loves to do, to redeem and bring blessing and healing out of evil things. And then, as I come to the end, falling asleep. You know, the interesting thing in that passage in Thessalonians is that Paul says that Christian believers fall asleep in fact, that phrase, falling asleep, appears, I think it's seven times in the New Testament. That was the main way that Christian believers talked about death. Whereas it says that Jesus died. Do you see that? Jesus died and rose again, but we fall asleep. Now, why did the New Testament writers repeatedly say, use that phrase, falling asleep? And I think, is it just a nice sort of euphemistic phrase for something rather nasty? No, it's much more profound than that. Because the message is that Christ experiences the full awfulness of death so that we don't need to. In Christ, the sting and the power and the grip of death has been fatally weakened and life has triumphed. And so... We don't need to die. We fall asleep. So what's the difference? Well, it's interesting. From a medical point of view, sleep is a, is a form of temporary unconsciousness. The person who's asleep is temporarily inaccessible, but 
while they're asleep, the person is still there. They're intact. They're unharmed. This is why sleep is very different from a medical coma, unconsciousness caused by brain damage or something else. So the person is in no way damaged or harmed by the period of sleep. And that's the important message. When our loved one falls in asleep in Christ, they are in a still, in a sense, alive. They're safe. They're unharmed. But just like a sleeping person, they're inaccessible. But they're going to wake up again. And uh, we get this theme uh, in the Old Testament. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness when I awake. I shall be satisfied with your likeness. But something even more wonderful, I think, and that is our Heavenly Father allows us to practice what it's like to die faithfully, to die as a believer and a follower of Christ every single night of our lives. You know what it's like to fall asleep in Christ. It's like you've had this incredibly long day and you're so tired and all you need to do is get your head on the pillow and give way, and then whew, you fall asleep. In fact, to push the analogy a bit more, dying is like getting your head on the pillow after a very, very, very long day and a very, very long race, and it's getting your head on the pillow knowing that it's the first day of the holidays and looking forward to what you're going to awake to. So falling asleep is not something strange, alien, or terrifying. It's an experience that our Heavenly Father gives us advance so that we do not need to be fearful. And in fact, this is an ancient Christian tradition. In the old service of Compline, uh, the prayer of Simeon, Lord, now let thy servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen your glory. It was safe. For Simeon had only seen a baby. Do you remember in the temple? It was just a baby, and yet Simeon saw through the eyes of faith what this baby represented. My eyes have seen your salvation, and therefore, he says, it's safe. It's safe for me to sleep, go to sleep because I've seen your salvation. And that's why Simeon is a wonderful example for every Christian believer. It's safe for us to put our head on that pillow because by God's grace, we have also seen the first gleaming of his salvation. So as I come to the end, what are old people for? Well, interestingly, pretty well all this, the same things you can do on your deathbed. Prayerfulness, listening to others, investing in friendships, offering life wisdom, sharing our faith. People can be evangelists on their deathbeds, expressing gratitude providing positive models of letting go, hopefulness, leaving behind a legacy. You know, as we look back over a long life, there are some temptations. There are temptations to regret, if only, what, what if, why did that happen, and so on. So I found very helpful these three, these three statements. The good cannot be lost. Anything that's good that's happened in our life, it cannot be lost. It's there by God's grace. It's secure in his own knowledge and in his own providence. The evil, and there's all for all of us, there's all evil as we look back. Amazingly, that evil can be redeemed, and the best is yet to come. And so I'll close with, again, this proverb. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter until the full light of day. And there's this wonderful image. I want to die with my eyes on that dawn, looking for the full light of day, knowing that whatever happens, nothing can stop it. The day is coming. Amen. We have a few minutes for some questions. And as before, I'll ask you to pass the microphone along the way. Put your hand up, microphone is in the way.
Thank you very much for this wonderful series. Would you mind very quickly reviewing the books that you have written to say which, which is the purpose of each one of them? <laughs> Thank you very much. That's kind. Uh, I've actually, it's on my next slide. This wasn't a plant, but... Um, <laughs> so, um, Dying Well is the book which most reflects this last seminar and which, if you're interested and want to take further, that would be the book which most reflects these themes and also other resources. The Final Lap is just a very short book. Uh, you can read it an hour or two, and that really covers uh, most, the whole seminar series at a very lightweight uh, and, and easily accessible book. There's, there's a book called Right to Die, um, which I wrote several years ago, and that looks more at the issues of euthanasia and assisted suicide, but it also has more detail about palliative care, about the medical side of palliative care, and, uh, and what, what Cicely Saunders uh, and, and so on, what she developed. Um, and then I have a book called Matters of Life and Death. That's a sort of a bigger book which really looks both at issues at the beginning of life, issues at the end of life, and tries to relate them to, to a Christian perspective. Uh, and finally, I have a book called The Robot Will See You Now, something completely different about artificial intelligence and Christianity. Sorry. Uh, another question? I can't see anyone. John, here. Thank you. Your left. <laughs> right. Sorry. Got you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, John, are, are you saying that when a Christian dies, they actually go into a state of unconsciousness until Jesus returns? So I think what I've been taught is that, you know, when the Christian dies, they go to be with Christ in a conscious way. Um, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, dying thief, that sort of thing. Could, could you help me with that? <laughs> Thanks. This is, this is a real theological conundrum, and I'm just a baby doctor. You know, what do I know? But I'll, I'll, I'll um, you know, what happens to us when we die? And uh, some theologians call this the intermediate state. Uh, but the most helpful thing I have read and, and thought about this is the idea that when we're living here on earth, our, our bodies are a very complex unity. The way the Bible thinks about us as human beings is that we're a very complex unity with lots of different aspects. There's a physical aspect, our physical bodies, but there's also an immaterial, a non-physical, intangible aspect. And the Bible talks about words like spirit and soul and, and, um, and other words to use this, this immaterial thing. What happens when we die seems to be that our bodies go into the grave, but this immaterial thing whatever it is, the person, the real person, remains safe and asleep in, in God's, uh, in the presence of Jesus. And then at the resurrection, our new bodies are reunited and we are raised as fully whole physical and immaterial unities again. So, so this, this, I think that's my best understanding of what goes on, I suspect that we, it is hidden from us, the details, because as fallen human beings, if we knew the details, we would abuse that information, and there's lots of things that are above our pay grade uh, as human beings, and this is one of it. Just a quick question about the lasting power of attorney for health. Um, I don't actually have any immediate family, so no obvious choices. How important do you think it might be to pick someone who has medical knowledge? Thanks, that's a very good question. Um, I don't think it is important at all to have somebody with medical knowledge. What I do think is absolutely important is to pick someone who you are completely trustworthy. Um, because unfortunately, there have been a whole series of terrible abuses because you know, I've, I've acted as a power of attorney for my uncle who had severe dementia and he gave me power of attorney. And I realized I had 
total control over his savings, which amounted to hundreds of thousands of pounds. I just had a credit card. Nobody was asking how I was spending the money. Nobody was checking up. Uh, I had an amazing amount of power. It was quite frightening how much legal power I had. Um, and, it just, and that's not surprising, therefore, that when you hand this to fallen human beings, um, that there have been a lot of scandals, so much so that some people have said, so I know that some judges have said, this is so dangerous, we're not sure we should be doing this anymore. But I think, so, that, so that's the most important thing. It's, it's not their medical or technical knowledge, it's the trustworthiness. This is someone I would trust with my life, I would trust with my credit card. I believe they genuinely want to do the best for me. Could you tell me, please, what engages the power of attorney? And the other thing was, on your book, The Last Lap, you show an old car going up a hill. I think you should have a new car which won't drive into a brick wall, keeps you in the lane, and has really bright headlights. <laughs> <laughs> I shall put you in touch with my publishers. The truth is that authors have virtually no control over what goes on the, on the cover. And I did have certain discussions with the publishers, if I put it that, about the cover. But anyway, uh, <laughs> how does the power of attorney become engaged? Um, what happens is that you, you, you have to sign all the forms, you have to, the, they all need to be witnesses, it's quite a long process. Once it's all signed, it just remains in the bank or wherever you've stored it, and it, it, it isn't activated until you, the person concerned, starts to lose their own capacity and, uh, and, a bit, and legal ability to, to make decisions and choices. So, so the, the fact that we've given our children this terrifying control over our lives and bodies and so on, uh, doesn't actually click in. At the moment, we're still able to make our own decisions and live our own lives, but it means, and of course, the thing is, is I don't know what's going to happen on traveling home from Keswick. You know, Celia and I will be in the car together. Who knows, by God's providence, we could be involved in a terrible road accident and find that we're, neither of us was in a state to look after our affairs. And at that point, these documents will allow our children to make decisions in our best interests. And, and somewhere else, another question? Yep. 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 Um, going back to one of the early things you said about pride. I'm going back now to the 80s, and I'd been a Christian probably less than a year, and I said to one of someone who I saw as a friend, I know that I am saved by the power of Jesus. And the guy said to me, what, you shouldn't say that, that's pride. What you should say, Michael, is you hope you're saved. Now, to me, I don't see it that way. If I say, I hope I am saved, I'm saying, well, I'm hoping Jesus has died for my sins, but I'm not really sure. Yeah. Now, I'm absolutely sure that Jesus died for my sins. And if I don't walk out of this hall this morning, I know that I'm in his love, in his hands, and perfectly safe. Correct. Yeah. Well, but, uh, well you're right. Do, uh, the, the question I want to ask, John, I, do, I thought I'd better explain that first. If I were confronted with a non-Christian asking me that question again, what would be your advice on the best way to answer it? I know how I feel inside, but getting that message over to this person and also that they need Jesus to be sure that they're saved. That's my question. Sorry if it's complicated. Yes. No, thank you. And thanks very much for the question. Well, I, no, I think you're absolutely right that when Christians hmm? talk about hope, it's not a kind of, well, I'm, I've no. got my fingers crossed and I'm, I'm hoping for the best. It, it's much more a, a steadfast confidence and trust. Ultimately, you know, it, it is about trust. I, do I really trust my wife? Do I really trust that she is who she says she is, that she really does love me, that she's going to be there for me, whatever happens? Yes, I do. I, I know her, I love her, and I trust her. 
And it's just the same when it comes to our Lord. Uh, and the more we know him, the more we discover his wonderful nature, the more we say, I can trust you completely. And somehow, that's what we've got to explain to our non-Christian friends. And, and actually, that's quite difficult because it sometimes just seems like gobbledygook to them. And in the end, you, all you can say is, taste and see. Try for yourself. Reach out and see whether Jesus is real and whether he can be trusted. We're going to have to, uh, we're going to, have to stop there, I'm afraid. Lots of, lots of questions. And the questions that have come in today and on uh, the other three mornings are, are just a reminder of how much John has engaged with us in such an exceptionally helpful way. I think I, I speak for uh, many, if not all of us in the room, to say I personally have been so glad uh, to be here. And I want to thank John very, very much indeed on behalf yeah. of all of us. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the members of our prayer team are available. If, you, if, if this has raised particular issues for you, they're available right now over here if you'd like to speak to one of them. Um, otherwise, the next meeting is, of course, the Bible reading at 11.15, so do come in for that. Let me close this meeting with a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord, that for those who trusted in you, there is the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, and that what we face is not death in the sense that Jesus faced it because he died in our place, but falling asleep in Christ. And we pray that both at a practical level and at a spiritual level, you'd use what we've learned this morning to help us to be ready for that day. We thank you, too, for our brother John. We thank you for his ministry of writing, the way he serves the church. And we pray for him and Celia for a safe return and that you will continue to use them very greatly for the blessing of your people in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.